Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 118 of the podcast. It's the 4th of April, 2018, as I record this intro. And this week on the podcast, I speak with Nicole Verde, known online as Verde Mama. (laughs) Nicole is a full-time unschooling mom and part-time librarian. She's also the home ed columnist at Juno Magazine, where she writes about unschooling. We have a great conversation about how, with unschooling, everything's connected. And right now, I'm sitting here watching snow fall and listening to the wind blow wildly. It's so not spring. I think I just really like to see the sun. Not for the heat so much, but the brightness. It's decidedly dull and has been for a long time. The windstorm also knocked out our internet for a while earlier today, right in the middle of a podcast call. So after my sincere apologies, we'll try again next week. It's podcast life. But I want to share a huge thank you to everyone who has chosen to support the show on Patreon. And a big welcome to new patrons, Kat Funk, Karen Sklanny, Sarah Qualman, and Eva Andriotti. I deeply appreciate all my patrons and their generous support. It's vital to helping me share unschooling information and inspiration with anyone who wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. And this week's quote is from Nicole, and we were talking about her children's paths to reading. Looking back, we did recognize that she had a lot of dyslexic traits that probably made it a slower path for her, but it was not a worse path. She was still learning so much every day and getting so much information and experimenting and observing and learning through just a different pathway. I just loved that point. It was a slower path, but not a worse path. So many unschooling parents with children who learned to read when they were older have shared that insight, me included. Not reading did not get in the way of their learning. They had different learning styles and strengths and interests. Their path was different, not worse. It's one of my favorite insights. And now let's get to my conversation with Nicole. Hi everyone, I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Nicole Verde. Hi Nicole! Hi Pam! Hi! Just a brief introduction, I first connected with uh, Nicole online a while ago, I I think it was on Instagram, and I really enjoyed her pictures and her comments about their unschooling lives and eventually I enjoyed reading her writing as the home ed columnist for Juno Magazine. So with my interest peaked, I was excited to chat with her in person and was so happy when she agreed to come on the podcast. So to get us started, Nicole, can you share with us a bit about you and your family? I'd be happy to. Um, And thanks so much. It's been really interesting to connect with you and I um, am pleased to be on the podcast. So (laughs) um, I'll start with just talking a little bit about my life with my kids and then we can take it from there. So, um, I've been married to my husband, Anthony for 20 years or almost 20 years. Um, and he's my absolute best friend and without him, I wouldn't be able to do all of this. So, um, we started our lives together, um, as a couple that wanted to do something different than what we had already known our lives to be. Like we grew up in the suburbs and went to public school and it was a good life, but we wanted to kind of see what else was out there. So um, we pursued 
a lifestyle of sort of slow, low budget travel. Um, we had an old Volkswagen bus that we fixed up and, you know, just kind of wanted to experience life and, uh, pursue experiences over, you know, money and sort of stability. But, um, so eventually we got married after four years of being together. And then four years after that, we had our first child. Um, so we had a lot of time to establish, um, sort of how we wanted to experience life together. Um, and at that point we decided we wanted more stability and we wanted to be able to provide a life that was going to feel secure and, um, and, and comfortable for our children. So, um, that's the point where Camille came into our lives. She is now 14. Um, also call her Cam. So either one of those will probably <laughs> be referring to her as, um, and then three years later, we had Sylvia who's now 11 and then Ayla came along and she's a seven year old. Um, so we have, I've always known that I wanted to homeschool them. Um, so that's always been a part of our lives. And about seven years ago, um, we all up and moved out to the country on a 11 acre parcel of land. Um, none of us had ever lived in the country. We didn't know a lot about how it was going to be. So we started out renting, but eventually um, found that everybody really thrived out here and bought our little unfinished house and learned how to go about, you know, finishing a home and tiling floors mm -hmm. and framing out walls and just sort of learning as we go. And um, so, yeah, that's where we're at now. <laughs> And uh, it's been a really good journey to get here so far. Yay. Yeah, that sounds so interesting. I love the way uh, you mentioned that you guys rented first, just to get a sense for it, if that was something that's going to mesh with everybody, right? The lifestyle before you decided to jump into it. Right, right. We were open to the possibility, but we didn't want to, you know, sort of commit to something mm -hmm. that wasn't gonna be what we had imagined that it could be yeah I know that's that's a brilliant way to go about it you know because there's always well not always but there's often like a little step it doesn't everything doesn't have to go in one big leap you know right often there's well we can try this out let's try this out and see try this out and see so you know that that you can take in the experience and process it rather than feeling committed you know, where there, that often builds up resistance. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you said that uh, you had always known that you guys would homeschool. So I was wondering, how did you discover unschooling? And what did your family's move to unschooling look like? Um, yeah, well, we had started out um, with our children. Um, two of them were born at home. And we always had a very sort of attachment parenting style of raising them. They were co-sleeping and got carried around in baby carriers <laughs> as much as they wanted. And just, you know, we really loved them up. And uh, so when it came, when Cam was school age and it came time to make that decision, I thought, well, let's just, you know, do this for this one year and, and see how that goes from there for kindergarten. And, um, and I hadn't ever heard of unschooling. I didn't know a lot of people who homeschooled. Um, but so I, I got a curriculum. It was a, a Waldorf curriculum. And I thought it looked really natural and lovely and, you know, all the beautiful wooden toys. Yeah, and so I was yeah. like, yeah, we're going to do this. And uh, it didn't last probably more than a week and a half because... <laughs> um, <laughs> Cam's a very strong-willed, amazing child, and I realized it was starting to develop this sort of coercive relationship, not only between Cam and I, but with the idea of learning and what an education is. And I was like, okay, this isn't why <laughs> I want to keep my child home, you know, from school and learning this way. And we'd been learning together all along, so... Um, yeah, I realized we were just going to keep doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I discovered unschooling, um, you know, more as 
like the community and online community of people who are like, yeah, we've been doing this for years and here's some ideas. And so that was um, helpful and fun to find too. So it was a reasonably easy shift then, eh? So it was just trying to bring in the curriculum. It didn't fit well with your daughter. And then, you know, so it was a pretty easy shift for you to recognize that that was getting in the way and we're going to do it another way. Yeah, I think it was a pretty natural progression. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, just from how we'd been living and learning up until that point. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like that's, you're basically after a couple of weeks went back to the lifestyle you were already living, right? Right. Yeah. yeah more or less. Yep. Yeah. That's <laughs> and awesome. And eventually um, my oldest child did want to try out school for mm-hmm. first grade. So she did that for um, maybe two months, you know, really enjoyed it for a little while there. And then was like, yeah, I liked it better at home and just really enjoyed the the freedom to pursue her own interests and to learn in a way that um, excited her about mm-hmm. what she was interested in at the moment. So, yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Now, uh, as I mentioned, I was checking out your column in Juno magazine and I really love the series that you've been doing there, looking at how different topics or subjects, you know, from a more schoolish mindset, can weave into our unschooling lives. And eventually, we noticed that they all of those topics and subjects weave together into just living, and we come to see how everything's connected. But especially when we first start unschooling, it can be helpful for um, parents to notice all the ways that we can engage with different subjects because a lot of us haven't done that work before we decide to homeschool and unschool, and we still see learning in those those subject oriented ways. So I think doing this helps to open up our perspective and see um, beyond the classroom and teaching as the only way to learn. So I would really love to touch on a few of them with you and wanted to start with unschooling and art. So I was hoping you'd talk about how might art organically weave into our days and how can we support that with our kids? Okay. Um, I think that art is a really fun and easy one for people to grasp um, because it's such a creative process, you know, Mm -hmm. that it doesn't need to be a subject that's sort of taught from a top down perspective. Um, So I think, you know, number one is just providing the supplies for the children, you know, setting out little invitations to create by, you know, maybe putting some fabric scraps and and some uh, pieces from the recycling bin and some buttons and some glue out and see if anybody's interest gets sparked by it or, you know, always having a drawer where the paint is available or um, so a lot of it, I think, is just making those supplies available to them. Um, we've been enjoying uh, making little sculptures out of wire and beads and sticks lately. <laughs> That's been fun. Um, but also beyond that, um, some, you know, some things are harder to do that way. Like my kids have taken art classes, like um, pottery is one that I wasn't uh, able to provide, you know, sort of easily and more loosely. Um, Uh, Cam had taken a blacksmithing class at one point and done a little bit of woodworking. So some of those are Mm -hmm. things where I saw an interest and sort of sought out either a mentor um, type situation or a a class like a homeschool class or otherwise community class um, where, you know, kids could try those things out too. Um, Yeah. So I think art is just a fun one to incorporate in that in that organic way for sure. Yeah, I thought that that's why I thought we'd start with an easy one. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But it's so important, I think, um, to, I loved your idea of just putting things out and things you wouldn't at first think of, right? Because at first, when you come from a schoolish mindset, you're thinking of art, you know, you're, okay, you're thinking of painting, you're thinking of drawing. And so often we're also stuck in the mindset that there's like a right way to do it, right? Right. 
Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, you should paint this first and, and you should color in the lines. And, you know, oh, if you want to be able to draw a person, let's go look up, you know, how to do it and stuff. So right. to be able to just relax, like you were talking about, just the creativity and letting it flow and putting, you know, just all sorts of any, like you said, sticks, wrapping sticks, decorating sticks, you know, it's you just see so much bigger picture of what art and the creative arts can be, right? right. That really helps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually um, lead an art workshop at my library every Monday. Mm -hmm. I work at a library. And um, so when I lead this art workshop, the kids who come into it get really excited to take the materials that are available and run with them. And that's mm -hmm. really what I encourage. Um, but so every other week I do a teen and adult workshop and there's so much hesitation there and so much of a um, sort of looking to me as what I, I expect them to, to do for their art. And I'm like, this is for you. You know, so many <laughs> people say, I'm not creative. I'm not artistic. And I'm and, and I understand where that comes from. Like, I know that, you know, somewhere along the way, it sort of got like to be where there's these creative people and then there's everybody else. And it's sort of this special category. And I just try and remind everyone that we're all creative and artistic. It just comes out, you know, in different expressions for different people. So that is such a great example <laughs> to share how you see the difference between the kids and the adults, because I think, I mean, I would be one of those adults, right? Because you, you feel, I would feel um, judged that there was like a right way to do something. And I'd be like, well, you know, show me how to do it. Tell me what colors, what to put here, how to draw, you know, right. I, I am still so trained to look for directions that, you know, if I sat down with a blank sheet and said, draw, I would have to think, <laughs> think for a while. <laughs> like even those, those, um, paint, paint by number things, you know, that you right. can do or, you right. know, or the the paint and sip kind of things, you know, here, follow these directions and everything. OK, I would definitely be one of those people putting <laughs> the pattern on my and, canvas and following the right color. <laughs> but well, we those are fun, too. And there's yeah. no sleep on there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, you know, I do always try to have a prompt because I have people have gotten kind of stuck in that, you know, where it's like, oh, it if it's not your expectation that you're going to come in and sort of be really yeah. open-ended, <laughs> it can be a hard transition to go from that blank piece of paper to creating something you feel good about. So yeah, but, I always try to have some kind of <laughs> prompts there for the, for the people for the who old want people them. Like me. <laughs> but yeah, that's one of the things when you're first, um, you know, letting your kids take the reins, it was so uh, valuable for me to to um, catch myself and not try to direct and notice how incredibly creative um, my kids were because they weren't used to that kind of direction. So they didn't have that, you know, judgment that this is the way everything has a set way that it's supposed to be done. They hadn't ingrained that lesson yet. So, I mean, I would have, you, you know, you have hundreds and hundreds of um, pieces of art or, you know, they, they went through a phase where um, they wanted to sew and they made pillows and I went and got like this huge uh, bag of filling and, you know, we must have had a hundred pillows around with, <laughs> with buttons and, and faces drawn on and, you know, just a million things. It's like, wow. So part of that experience and seeing that they can do all these things without being directed is a really uh, great piece of de-schooling, I think. It is. It's really encouraging, too, I think, as a parent to see them um, mm -hmm. expressing themselves in unexpected ways. It's fun. Yeah, it's so fun. So how about unschooling and reading? Because outside of school, learning to read can look really different, can't it? It definitely does. Um, and I think a lot of that is because, you know, in school, um, reading education is is such a step by step linear mm -hmm. process. You feed children small bites of information and you accept, expect them to incorporate that um, into their own reading ability. But if you're stepping back from 
sort of expecting it to look the same for each child. It can be so wildly varied how they come to the understanding of reading for themselves. And um, so my first child, Camille, when she was three and a half, she pretty much started reading. Like I read to her all the time. I was available to, you know, for her whenever she wanted to, what's that word say? And why does it say that? And what do these letter sounds make? But I never um, had the intention that I was teaching her to read. Like it was just part of our being together. Mm -hmm. And one day she picked up the book and just started reading where I had left off. (laughs) Totally surprised and amazed. And this was a process that she had directed and um, internalized and then just sort of brought forth one day. So that (laughs) was really unusual and really surprising to me. But um, so it was fun to see them own that process for themselves. Um, But it did not go that way for all of my children. And um, so Sylvia, who's now 11, um, was not interested in reading for many years, not only, you know, not learning at three and a half, but um, seven, eight, still not really being that interested. Um, So we read together all the time, um, did the same types of activities that I'd done with Camille. Um, But Sylvia was such a a kinetic child and and just loved to hear stories and um, act them out and be expressive. But the sitting down, you know, eyes on the paper, making all of those word sounds come together to make sense wasn't her focus. Um, So now um, at the age of 11, she had she had kind of gone from at one point not not only not reading but not wanting to read, feeling frustrated by that to um, to just seeing it as a useful tool in her life. You know, she loves to cook. So if she was able to look at a cookbook or a recipe online and, and figure out how to do that on her own and to be able to be independent in that way, that was really meaningful to her. So so she took the time to sort that out, you know, um, and looking back, we did recognize that she had a lot of, you know, dyslexic traits that probably made it a slower path for her. Um, but it was not, um, it was not a worse path. It was, she was still learning so much every day and getting so much information and, um, experimenting and observing and, and learning through just a different pathway. Like reading's not the only source of that information for her for so long. So it was, and, and Ayla's still somewhere in that process. She's seven, um, you know, knows all the letter sounds, can can read words, but doesn't spend a lot of time, you know, with the nose in a book. Um, so for each of them to have their own pathway to mastering that and finding its usefulness um, while also learning so much all the time without it having to be just from that method, um, I think has been really empowering to each of them in their own way. Yeah, I really love that. I love your point that it's not a worse path. You know, just because it takes longer, longer before they are interested or gain the skill, however you want to say it until they're reading. But it's I mean, that that was my experience as well. And that was something that I really loved. Once the kids are out of school and away from, you know, that curriculum equal march you know, everybody marching and learning the same thing, right? uh, supposedly at the same, like on the same path with the same timing, like this in this year, and, and being judged when they're not, once you're away from that, you discover, like you were saying, the, the wide differences in different children, and, and you come to embrace that, right? Some are reading at three and a half, and, and some at 11, and neither one is a worse path. Each path is is the best for each of them, right? Exactly. Yeah, I, <laughs> I love that so much, because it it's outside of school, not reading is not a disadvantage to learning at all. 
Right. Because because if you're not reading yet, you have other skills that are your forte and you're absorbing and learning through those pathways, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And Sylvia is has a really strong vocabulary, is my most interested in storytelling child. Um, and so pretty much devoured audiobooks <laughs> in yeah. the way that a lot of other children would have been reading books. But the thing is, is it freed her up to be able to move around while she was listening to them and to think about even now she talks about how an author structured a sentence or was able to describe um an action in a way that was unexpected. And she loves those moments in storytelling, like, oh. and didn't need to, you know, just be sitting eyes on paper in order to get that. So oh, that, that reminded me because <laughs> Lissy too, before um, she was reading, went through um, a, a huge time when she was listening to audiobooks. books. She was listening to the Harry Potter audiobooks over and over, like <laughs> as much of the series that was there. And she was at the same time, she was making those pillows, <laughs> right? doing a lot of sewing. She had uh, little like vignettes or scenes from the books set up around her room. Like she was doing a million other things at the same time that she was constantly listening to them. So, you know, for her, that was a vital and fun and fascinating part of her journey, right? Absolutely. It's so fun to, it's so fun to just watch them and see how things develop, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> it really is. Okay, so <laughs> now we're getting a little bit more technical here. How about unschooling and science? Because really, science is everywhere, isn't it? <laughs> It definitely is. And I think science is another one of those that can feel sort of um, stressful maybe to a parent if they think, oh, now I have to, you know, teach my child science. But essentially, science is um, following curiosity, like asking a question and then thinking about that question like, oh, you know, forming a hypothesis is just coming up with possible answers, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and then, and then testing out those ideas that you come up with. And that's, that's a natural process, I think, for children, you know, from why is the sky blue to, you know, why does my kite fly or any of those things? Like there's, there's different ways of approaching that. Like you can just play with it, the ideas for a while, come up with your own ideas, um, you can look up those answers right away. And sometimes that is a, a really valuable way to go about it. But I think science can be so hands-on, um, even just from, you know, growing crystals in a, we grew crystals in an eggshell um, one year around Easter time because we'd looked up this experiment and, um, and it was really fun to do. But then after that, we started playing with how else can we grow crystals? And for a while, you know, like with you, with the pillows, we had crystals yeah. growing everywhere. <laughs> I <laughs> remember our rock different candy colors things. and yeah. some of them were salt and some of them were alum powder and they were just kind of proliferating all over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think science um, is so approachable if it's not, looked at as a separate subject from the rest of learning, you know, if mm -hmm. it's just looked at as a way to, to find more information in your life and, and try to, you know, satisfy that curiosity. And, um, yeah, I think, I think that that curiosity is the key, isn't it? That's the curiosity is what drives our kids and we're not snuffing it out, trying to put them on the path of, the science curriculum, right? And when, once you get past that curriculum-y thing um, and you just see them exploring the world, like you, you see the times when they're diving into crystals, right? You see the times when you're out flying kites and you're enjoying and chatting about how that works. Uh, you know, um, animals, you know, that's that's often why I talk about um, when you come to unschooling is really um, giving it diving into it for a year, 
because you can see a few of those um, times come up in the flow and you can see them, you know, if you thought about it, maybe whatever they dove into, they probably covered three or four years worth of that topic, if you were to relate it to a curriculum, right? Because they just dive in and they they sponges suck it all in <laughs> because they're so curious and they're like, oh, right. they want more and more and more. Um, and some things they just kind of pass by and they aren't interested. But once you see like over, over six months or a year that that pattern, that there is things, there will always be things if you're um, not trying to direct them, that they feel really free to follow their curiosity, they will. And they pick up so much. And when you um, take away the, the topic direction, I guess how how one defines science, you start to see aspects of it everywhere. Like you said, just just something comes up. Oh, I wonder how that's going to happen. You know, how what's going to happen after I do this? You, you got your hypothesis right there. You got the experiment as they figure it out. You know, if you want to at some point, if they want that more particular language, they'll realize oh, I've been doing that for years. <laughs> exactly right. Sometimes you start out flying kites, and you're later talking about velocity and lift and all of a sudden mm-hmm. looking at how airplanes, you know, fly or looking up a Mythbusters episode about, yeah, it. Yeah. you know, like <laughs> it, those pathways can, can go pretty deep sometimes and really, you know, engage their curiosity. But um, I think because it's not sort of a dry textbook example, they really do get a lot out of it. Yeah, that, I mean, that hands-on nature is, is so key just yeah. because, That's how they're engaged in the moment, right? Because with the textbook, it's so much harder to engage with the content and then it doesn't connect with things for you because it's not part of your day. And I mean, the learning is just so much deeper with unschooling. It's it it almost seems that's one thing I think that can trip us trip us up earlier on, too, is because they look like they're just playing. Right. Right. <laughs> and it, it, because the learning looks, quote, easy because because you're not, oh, I'm going to do this to learn. I'm just doing this. But the learning happens almost as a side effect, right, of just doing things because because they're engaged with it and they're enjoying it and it's making sense to them. It's just naturally connecting to the knowledge that they already have and and growing their understanding of what it is. Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think learning becomes viewed as as a tedious um, Mm -hmm. sort of process if you're looking at it from outside. But then that's where sometimes maybe people fail to see that what they're learning when they're quote unquote playing that, you know, that it learning doesn't have to be difficult or drudgery, that it is exciting and just a natural part of life. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a huge piece of de-schooling for people is, is you expect, we come to it often expecting, you know, learning's hard. <laughs> right. Because, because it is hard so often in school, precisely because you're not engaged with it. It doesn't, it, it isn't meaningful to you in that moment. It's something you have to, it's like a random thing that you have to memorize because you can't really understand it because it doesn't fit in with your particular perspective or understanding of things. So it literally is a lot harder in school. So it's a huge shift to see how, how learning, um, just naturally, what do you mean you let them play all day? Right. 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 (laughs) But that's what I mean. That experience, let them go at it. See what you see. You will see them learning amazing things because like you said, your, your daughter's extensive vocabulary, um, you know, because she enjoys listening to stories. So even though she's not reading, you, you know, over a few months, you see her using all these new words and using them in the right context. And it's like, oh, I noticed this. But yeah, it's not something you can sit and measure because you know what? So often you don't even know what it is that they're learning particularly from it. Right. Right. Because that's all happening in their mind. It's, you know, maybe a few days, a few weeks, even a few months later, as you see them using that knowledge, you're like, oh, hey, look, <laughs> they picked that up. Right. <laughs> right. And I think a lot of that is learning to um, 
sort of let go of the idea that we need to be controlling everything they do that like they can own those moments of discovery. Like we're not, you know, sitting there saying this is a metamorphosis rock or whatever that yeah. might not even be the right term. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like look and they're like, Oh, how did this come to be formed? Or like one of my children is really interested in foraging for her food. Like she loves to go out in the woods and just, and you know, we've obviously been very careful about, you know, don't eat anything unless you can positively identify it a hundred percent, you know, it's edible, but she knows so much about now what plants are medicinal. You know, if somebody gets a bee sting, she's the first one there with the plantain to put on it. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, when, when people sometimes are like, well, what do you do for science? And, and at first, when I was early on in unschooling, I'd be like, uh, you know, I wouldn't really know how to answer that question. I uh, I would try to describe what we had been doing recently. You know, maybe we'd played with snap circuits or, um, you know, we'd gone foraging mm-hmm. for wild edibles or something. So I would usually just try to come up with an example of what our most recent discoveries were. But a lot of that was... Um, yeah, following their interest because their focus is so powerful. If if they're not interested in, in the information that somebody is trying to impart to them, they're not going to be taking it in. Um, so, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, earlier this week, um, I came across a Neil deGrasse Tyson quote, which I loved. So I thought it would fit in very nicely here. I'm just going to share it for a second. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, he, he wrote. I'm often asked by parents, what advice can I give them to help get kids interested in science? And I have only one bit of advice. Get out of their way. (laughs) Kids are born curious, period. I don't care about your economic background. I don't care what town you're born in, what city, what country. If you're a child, you are curious about your environment. You're overturning rocks. You're plucking leaves off of trees and petals off of flowers, looking inside. And you're doing things that create disorder in the lives of the adults around you. (laughs) And so then what do adults do? They say, don't pluck the petals off the flowers. I just spent money on that. Don't play with the egg. It might break. Don't. Everything is a don't. We spend the first year teaching them to walk and talk and the rest of their lives telling them to shut up and sit down. So you get out of their way and you know what you do? You put things in their midst to help them explore. Help them explore. Why don't you get a pair of binoculars? Just leave it there one day. Watch them pick it up. Watch them look around. They do all kinds of things with it. And I thought that was just amazing because that's what exactly what we're talking about. It is right? that that's perfect. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's exact. And then and then and then they send them to school. But <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. You know, even even if school is part of your life, you know, that's fine. But you can still be exploring the world and putting interesting things down. Like I still remember when I got um, it was just this little plasticky. Um, circle thing that that made a hologram. I think I got it. We used to love going to the science center and we would just play around there. And we always left like a half an hour to look around the store after because it was always fun to see all the cool things that they had there, you know, and just putting it out. And and every couple of weeks I would change up whatever was inside for the hologram and they'd be like, oh, cool. (laughs) And they'd see something else showing up, you know, it even little puzzle games and just binoculars we've got three or four pairs of those lying around um you know just putting fun stuff and maybe at first you know we're thinking oh this is something science related but eventually you can get past that to the point where this is something that's going to be fun that I think will be fun that even if my kids don't pick it up I think so like I was the one changing the thing the hologram because <laughs> I thought it was so cool <laughs> and they'd walk by and go oh yeah nice 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 mom <laughs> you know I think that is so key though really because if we're looking at science as, you know, this curiosity based, exciting way to sort of discover new things about the world. Like if as the adults and parents in their lives, we maintain that for ourselves, that curiosity, that way of looking at life, like, oh, I wonder what'll happen if I do this, you know, Mm -hmm. or I wonder why that works the way it does. Like, um, it, it's so not only does it bring new things into their, um, environment, 
if we're bringing home, you know, things that we think are exciting and they might get an interest in it. But it, it's sort of an example to them. Like it doesn't, the learning doesn't stop at a certain point. You know, the curiosity and excitement about life can continue. To be like, mm-hmm. like I've told my kids several times, especially my teenager, like these are not necessarily you know, the best years of your life. Like it can be hard to be this age. Like I, mm-hmm. I understand, but you know, life continues to get exciting. Like I'm 40 and I'm probably, you know, happier now than I've been at other years. And hopefully I'll be happier again next year. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really love that, Nicole. That's such a great point. Like if we're unschooling our children, choosing to unschool our children, choosing, you know, that lifelong learning is something we we want to um, want them to be able to live their lives um, with, through perspective, however you want to phrase that. But if we're not living it, you know, this is for us too. If this is a lifestyle we want for our children, why don't we want it for ourselves, right? Definitely. You know, yeah, we want them to grow up and be curious continue to be curious and learning all the time and everything. Well, if that's the kind of adult we're wishing adulthood, we're wishing for our children. Um, it's not too late for us. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, We too can do it. <laughs> okay. It's easy uh, to forget that, but it's, it's I know. to have that reminder too. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's so often I talk about, you know, my children being my guides because they're my reminder when I see them enthusiastically diving into something or enjoying something or just having fun. It's that's like that quick reminder to, you know, Oh, am am I still doing that in my life? Right. Yeah. Enthusiasm's, you know, contagious if you let it be. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. I'm not trying to tamp it down. You know that I think that's a huge shift when you first come to it because we've, we've learned, haven't we, you know, Um, just growing up, not to show so much enthusiasm, you know, as adults, now you're supposed to know everything, you know, all those conventional messages that we have to work through and go, no, you know, I, it's okay that I don't know everything. It's okay to say, I don't know that it's okay to be curious and excited, you know, (laughs) The other adults may look at you funny when you're <laughs> excited out there, you know, your daughter, right. brings, it's all oh, cool, cool. You dive in, you know, maybe I'll even try the trampoline, <laughs> but that's okay because it you know is. what? It's a much and, more know, fun life. <laughs> sometimes it gives those other adults kind of that permission to, you know, be playful yeah. too. I've definitely been that one at the playground or the yes. children's museum or something that's like <laughs> too excited for other people's comfort. <laughs> Sometimes they join in, you know, sometimes they're like, yeah, it's, it's like they were waiting for permission, right. but then they do. Right. <laughs> and then all of a sudden everybody's having fun. Right. For sure. Okay. Um, so your eldest cam chose to go to a, an alternative school last year. So I just thought uh, you might share with us a bit about how she's found that experience. Yeah. Well, first of all, she really, really likes it. Um, and as far as it being an alternative public school, it is, um, really ideal for our situation. Like it's a, it's about self-directed learning, which is what we've been talking about yeah. a lot. Um, very project-based, um, interest-led. So essentially the students at this school um, design their own schedule. So they, you know, they do get credit for it and they're getting high school credit. So there is there is that separating things into subjects, you know, mm-hmm. you do something for a history project, But they choose what they're doing. Um, If you walk into the school at any given point in time, um, one student might be taking apart a lawnmower or somebody else might be um, editing a a music video that they created. So it's um, some students will be, you know, working on papers and doing things that look schooly, (laughs) but (laughs) it's by their choice how they want to approach that. Um, So as far as CAM goes, um, some of the projects that she's been working on this year are, um, she took a woodworking class. She's, um, she's been playing the alto saxophone for about uh, four or five years. So she does participate in um, a high school band that is that is part of a larger high school um, and jazz band. She's 
decided to try wrestling as a freshman in high school, which is after never having done any adult organized competitive sport (laughs) and just really took it on and, and was weightlifting and, um, gaining all the skills to go out there and wrestle people who had been wrestling since they were kindergartners, you know, so that takes a lot of guts. I was proud of her Mm -hmm. for doing that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and so it's been really in keeping with the way that Cam has been learning, um, as an unschooler, um, but in a, in a different environment, in an environment where you are accountable for your hours spent, um, but you still get to choose how you're spending those hours. So, mm-hmm. yeah, she actually oh, wrote a research paper on uh, transgender people in different countries throughout history and sort of what that identity was for them. And so she was able to then get history, partial history credit and partial English credit for that, um, because it's a subject that she's interested in. So, yeah, oh, that's really interesting. That sounds, uh, like a pretty cool place. That's, you know, for, if, if you're choosing school, that's, that's a, a nice step, nice environment. Yeah. So are there, so, um, time-wise, like you said, they define their schedule. So is there like a, Certain certain number of hours a week that they need to be there. The certain set of hours per day. Um, How does that work? She goes during regular school hours. Um, they uh-huh. have the option to work from home at times if they choose, um, or to do like volunteer work in the community as part of their hours, or even um, start a business as part of it. So they have a lot of freedom, but um, a lot of the children do go there during normal school hours Mm -hmm, and spend mm -hmm. their time in that environment working on their projects because they have and they have 3d printers and uh, yeah music editing equipment and microscopes and access to all of that so Uh, yeah that's very cool they've got some supplies there that uh that they can play with where right and it's nice to see because we live in you know, in a rural, fairly conservative community in the Midwest. And, and they, this is part of a, a larger public high school. It's a, it's a smaller charter school within a larger high school and Ah. they're looking to expand and getting support and people are recognizing that this is, you know, a valid way to learn, um, where students Mm -hmm. are able to really engage with their own interests. So that's exciting to me. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Now, you also work part-time as a librarian. Um, So I was, I know some people are um, looking at weaving work into their lives too. So I just thought maybe you could share a bit how that works for you guys. Sure. Um, So before I started working at the library, um, Cam had been volunteering there once a week. So um, I wasn't actually looking for a job at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't have a degree in library sciences or anything. I had worked at a library before at a larger city library um, where I was primarily just shelving books. Um, but so one day when I walk into the library and I think I was picking Cam up from her volunteer job or I was bringing the other girls in to get some books or something, the library director came up and was like, so we're going to have a position open, you know, would you be interested in applying? And, um, I, I thought for a minute, I tried to be really open to possibilities and things coming my way and, you know, (laughs) balancing that out though, because everything that you do take on, there's, you know, a time and energy exchange for that. So, um, I thought about it for a little while and I was like, yeah, I, I think that is something I'm interested in. My kids now are at an age where they don't need my sort of um, focused attention as many hours of, day, of the day. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're, yeah. they're more in the independent learning stage than they were than when they were younger. Um, and the library director is just a really fun, outgoing woman with purple hair. And she's like, so, you know, we'll really work with you. <laughs> like for your, you can, you know, help decide what hours are going to work. And if something comes up in your family and you, you know, you, so basically the flexibility of the position is mm-hmm. why I was able to take it on. Um, so 
I work three afternoons per week and I, like I said, I, I lead an art workshop on Mondays. So that's one of my afternoons and my children often come and participate in that with me. So, um, they're there during that time and I can bring them with me to work at any time, but they, they sometimes don't want to spend, you know, four and a half straight hours at the library. So, Mm. I'm also able to leave them home with my husband because he works from home most days as a full-time software developer. Mm -hmm. Um, So that really allows a lot of flexibility in our lives where he's here and available if if they need him. Um, So yeah, we're lucky to have kind of a, a flexible situation where we can make it work in that way. Yeah, that's really cool. And I I love your point about being open to the possibilities because, <laughs> you know, you never know where little things are going to come up. Right. You know, and, and to just think, oh, that's interesting. How would how might that work and thinking about that? So I thought that was that was a really neat point. So often we don't we don't know. Right. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Well, and it's been interesting because um, some of the things that I had to let go of to make time for that in my life. My children have been interested in picking up, like I used to grow a decent sized organic garden. And now my 11 year old's like, well, can I have all of the garden space since you didn't know <laughs> my garden go so terribly last summer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was like, yeah. Cause I made that choice that, you know, I couldn't do it all. And Um, you know, I could support the farmer's market if I couldn't grow it myself that (laughs) year or, you know, so she's now stepping up and wanting to take over that. And that's pretty exciting to me. Yeah. Oh, I love that. It's, it's the ripples, right? As, as we make choices, like you said, you know, well, you know, I'm choosing this other things, you know, I'm going to let go and, and then just as that ripples out so many other possibilities for things to happen. I mean, and I'm sure it would have been fine if, if nobody took it over, but it opens that possibilities for, for other people, right? You, you never really know that's that's what's so exciting about this life, isn't it? (laughs) It is. And I think if we were trying to control all the aspects, it, it wouldn't have nearly the sort of excitement to the learning and, and the possibilities. That's the thing. The hardest thing is letting go of the control. But after some experience, you realize that so often things go in directions that are even better and more exciting that we could never have, you know, predicted or 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 controlled things in that direction. You know what I mean? They turn out even better than what we imagine or could have envisioned. That's what I was trying to say. (laughs) I do find that happening often. (laughs) I know. It's amazing. (laughs) Well, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today, Nicole, because I had a lot of fun. Thank you, you Pam. I did too. (laughs) Yay. And before we go, where's the best place for people to connect with you online? Okay. So um, these days I mostly just post a little on Instagram where I'm Verde, V-E-R-D-E dot mama, M-A-M-A. And I also have a blog that I had started um, seven or eight years ago. It's verdemama.blogspot.com. And I don't post on there very often these days, but there's years worth of um, sort of my sharing my thoughts and photos of our days on there if anybody's interested. So that's awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks. You too, Pam. Bye. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also enjoy the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out my book, The Unschooling Journey, A Field Guide. Inspired by Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey framework, the book is a weave of myths, contemporary stories, and tales from my own journey. It's not a how-to book. No two paths through the world of unschooling have the same twists and turns. Yet, having a general sense of where you are on your journey can bring valuable insight as you navigate the challenges that will inevitably appear. Remember, you are the hero of your story.